Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame, where we tell you true stories about real people. Tonight, the story of Samuel Clemens, his pen name, Mark Twain. The warm, flooding spinner of tales lived life with the same boundless good humor and impulsive humanity that made him America's first and greatest humorist. The process that turns a boy into a man is familiar to all of us. The one that turns a man into a great writer is something less familiar. And we are especially pleased and proud to welcome in the role of Sam Clemens, Mr. McDonald Carey. And here is Frank Goss. 365 days a year, hearts are lightened by Hallmark cards. Happy days are made happier, lonely days become no longer lonely. And every day is a brighter day when the mail brings a Hallmark card. For Hallmark cards are more than just a message of cheer or sympathy or love. They are the right message, thoughtfully expressed in the right design, the right words. And that Hallmark in the back shows that you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the new color picture Knights of the Round Table in Cinemascope, starring Robert Taylor, Ava Gardner, and Mel Ferrer. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's true story of Mark Twain, starring Mr. McDonald Carey on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The environment of a boy's life does much to shape the man and in the case of Samuel Clemens, no one can doubt that his hometown contributed a great deal to the final product. Hannibal, Missouri, is a few miles above Pike County and a hundred miles from St. Louis. If you've never found it on a map, I'm sure you've found it in your heart. For there, among the rolling hills beside the great broad river, the man who wrote of Tom Sawyer and the Huckleberry Finn was a boy. I don't suppose you'll be able to go fishing, Sam. I don't suppose. Gotta go to school. I'm thinking how lucky Willie Bob is. Willie? Why, Sam, poor Willie's got the measles. He's awful sick. Willie doesn't have to go to school. He doesn't have to worry like we do about catching measles. There are lots of other reasons, too. I guess Willie's just about the luckiest there is. What you doing? I'm picking some flowers. What for? For Willie. His ma won't let you in, Sam. She won't let nobody in. My ma says he's awful sick. She'd skin me alive if I went near him. She says you aren't supposed to touch anybody who's got the measles. If you touch them, you get the measles. So long, Tom. Every boy in Hannibal used to pray very hard, hoping that someday the good Lord would let him grow up and become a pirate. Other times they prayed just as hard to become a circus clown. But the most permanent kind of praying and the most permanent ambition was to become a steamboat man. Steamboat a coming! Hey, Sam! Ain't you supposed to be in school? I got the measles. Yeah, uh, I heard how you got the measles. You went and crawled in bed with Willie Bowden, didn't you? Well, Willie didn't mind. No, Sam. 
What's going to become of you, boy? I'm going to be a steamboatman. <laughs> Come of you is the most overworked sentence in the English language. But in spite of it, boys grow up. They become men. And sometimes they settle down to a reasonable way of life. Other times, their ideas become more grandiose. What's this, Mr. Fang? I'm going to become an explorer on the Amazon, Cully. An explorer? I've been reading all about it. There's a lot of that river that needs exploring. All I have to do is go down to New Orleans and get a ship to South America. How much money you got, Sam? Thirty dollars. Well, it takes thousands of dollars to be an explorer. What do you know about it? What did you do if you did get there? Details. Difficult things to cope with and not to be taken seriously. However... There are other rivers beside the Amazon. There's the Mississippi and the steamboat. Going up and down the river All the live long day Aboard a steamboat, a man changes. First, he's an apprentice. Then, one day, a full-fledged pilot but only after he's learned 1,200 miles of the rolling, sprawling, magnificent Mississippi. Evening, Mr. Clemens. Evening, Cully. What's our depth? Mark four, sir. Keep sounding. Yes, sir. Going up and down the same man who started. No, sir. <laughs> but looking at you tonight and the last few days, I'd swear you got something up your sleeve, sir. I'm leaving the river. Quarter less three, sir. Well, what you gonna do now? I'm going out west to Nevada. My brother's out there. I think I'll try prospecting. And then what's gonna become of you? I don't know. Cully, how long you been on the river? Long as I can remember. Long time. When you look at it, what do you see? You mean catfish looking or life looking? <laughs> life? Well, sir, I see that a man's got to thrash some before he knows what he's about. He's got to move and stretch and do things. Thrash around. That's what a man's got to do. Well, when does he know when to stop? <laughs> well, that's easy. He knows when to stop when he finds somebody to love and some work to love. Man's got to have that. Half plain, sir. Is that what I'm looking for? Yes, sir. Just got to find him, too. A life don't mean nothing but trash. When am I going to find somebody to love? What am I meant to do, Cully? You've known me a long time. <laughs> oh, sir, you're a powerful good trasher. You find somebody and what to do. Probably at the same time. Yes, sir, you'll find them both. Yes, sir. Ah, here we are. Mark Twain, sir. Hmm? Mark Twain, sir. That's your count now. Mark Twain. Good night, Cully. Good night, sir. Going up and down the
Hello there. Hello there. I'm looking for a man named Sam Clements. I understand he's prospecting somewhere around here. My name's Sam Clements. What can I do for you? Well, I'll tell you. I run a newspaper in Sacramento. You can call me Steve. Sure. I saw your little story about the jumping frog of Calaveras County. How long have you been writing stories, Mr. Clemens? Oh, whenever I'm not doing something else. I heard you worked on the paper in Virginia City a while. Yeah, I've been a reporter and a printer. I was a speculator for a while, too. Had a nice office and a chair and desk. Business any good? Afraid not. Listen, I'm back to prospecting. I'm going to see that it's published. What? Your little story. I'm going to see that it's published and you'll be paid for it. Well, say now, that is something. Do you think anybody will ever read it? I think the whole world will read it, Mr. Clemens. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Why don't you stop being all these other things and start being what you are? Well, I'd like to do just that, but because people always wonder what'll become of me. But the point is, I don't know what I am. And whatever it is, I'm sure it hasn't been too satisfactory up to date. <laughs> You're a good writer, Mr. Clemens. You're a fine writer. And my guess is that you've been one for a long, long while and just never knew it. I'd like to have you take a job writing on my paper, traveling for us. Well, now, I, I'd like a job traveling and writing. When do I start? As soon as you can get to Sacramento. Oh, uh, Mr. Clemens. Yeah? What's that name you use on the story, uh, Mark Twain? Yes. Yes, that's the one. You keep that for yourself. From now on, people will know you as Mark Twain. <laughs> In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This weekend, a friend I hadn't seen since school days was in town, and I was amazed to find that after all these years, we felt and acted as though we'd never been separated. And you know, I decided that's because our friends are always a part of us. They're in the back of our minds and in the corner of our hearts every day. That's why it's such a good idea to send Hallmark cards to friends frequently, to let them know they're loved and thought of not only on their birthdays, but on all the special days in their lives that can be made brighter because you remember. It's so easy to remember, too. All you need is a Hallmark date book. It's a little pocket-sized booklet of calendars with space each day for your memos. In it, you'll note all your friends' birthdays, anniversaries, and special occasions you don't want to overlook. And remember, your Hallmark date book is a gift given to you from the fine store where you buy Hallmark cards. Pick up yours tomorrow. Enjoy closer, deeper friendships this year through your Hallmark date book and Hallmark cards. And now, Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Samuel Clemens, starring Mr. McDonald Carey. <laughs> better for the job of authorship than they did Samuel Clemens. He undertook it with his customary impulsiveness. His golden and colorful memory was filled with a rich store of scenes and people he'd met in his travels across America. And ultimately, it broadened as those travels took him to all parts of the world. He knew he'd found one love in his life. He kept searching for the other. And then, one night, aboard a ship to Europe. Well, since we're going to be seated at the same table for the rest of the voyage, I'd like to know exactly what they call you. Sometimes they call me Sam Clemens. Other times they call me Mark Twain. And then other times they call me some names I'd rather not mention in polite society like this. <laughs> well, I'm Charles Langdon from New York. And uh, I'll call you Sam. All right. <laughs> Your first time sailing abroad? Yeah, very first. Business or pleasure? Uh, both, in a way. 
I made a deal with a paper out in California. I'm supposed to send them notes every day and tell them what Europe looks like to me. On the other hand, I... I kind of made a deal with myself. I took the trip to enjoy it. If it works out to everybody's mutual happiness, it'll be a success. <laughs> Say, they're, they're going to have fireworks on deck tonight. I don't want to miss it. Uh, well, all right, Sam, I'll join you. Oh, oh you dropped something. Yeah, I got it, I got it. Oh, thank you. There we are. Oh, thank you. Wouldn't want to lose that. I don't blame you. Is she your wife? No. Your fiancé? No. This is your locket. It did fall out of your pocket, didn't it? Yes, it's mine, Sam. Who is she? Well, that's my younger sister, Sam. What's her name? Olivia. We'll call her Libby. Libby. I've been looking for her. What? I'd like to meet her. Well, I'd like to have you meet her, Sam. But when this voyage is over, and if you ever find yourself in New York, you must come out to Elmira. I'm sure Libby would enjoy meeting you. Is that a promise? Is what a promise? That I can come to your house and meet her? Well, of course, Sam. Um, uh, <coughs> Sam. May I have my picture back? <laughs> How do you do? Is this the home of Mr. Charles Langdon? It is. He's my son. Oh, then you're Mr. Langdon. I believe that's the usual relationship. <laughs> what can I do for you, young man? My son is at home at the prison. Oh. Well, something wrong? Well, my name is Sam Clemens, Mr. Langdon. Did Charles tell you about me? Should he have told me something about you, Mr. Clemens? Well. We traveled to Europe together, and he invited me to visit him here when I came back. I say. Well, I'm back, Mr. Langdon. <laughs> oh, well. Uh. Who is it, Papa? I'm expecting some packages from the dressmaker and... How do you do? Oh, how do you do? This is Mr. Clemens, dear. Mr. Clemens, this is my daughter, Olivia. I know. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Clemens? Uh, Mr. Clemens has come to visit Charlie, dear. That's his luggage out there on that cab. Oh, isn't that nice? Did Charlie say anything to you about having a house guest? Oh, no, Papa. Well, he certainly didn't say anything to me. Can't you say something to me? Why, why, yes, of course. Come in, Mr. Clemens. I'll fix you some tea. <laughs> Libby, I want to know how long this is going to last. How long is what going to last, Papa? This visit from Mr. Clemens. Well, Papa, he's only been here a week. Allow me to correct you, Livy. He has been here ten days. Presumably to visit Charlie. He has seen Charlie exactly once. The rest of the time he has spent with you. But, Papa, if he hadn't had the accident and fallen out of the carriage Sunday when he was getting ready to leave, why, he wouldn't be here now. We couldn't let him go with a bumped head, could we? Libby, I'll ask you bluntly. I want to know if that young man has made any advances to you. Yes, Papa. Libby! But they've all been very proper. And will you explain that, please? He wants to marry me, Papa. And I want to marry him. Oh, there you are, Libby. Oh. Hello, Mr. Langdon. Oh, Clements. Just the man I was hoping to see. Libby has just delivered some very frightening news to me. She says you have asked her to marry you. Yes, sir. Then why, sir, did you not ask me? I want to marry her, Mr. Langdon, not you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we were coming to you, sir. We want to be married, Papa, but we want to have your consent. That's uh, what I meant, sir. I see. Can we have it, sir? Mr. Clemens, I know nothing of you except that you prefer your egg scrambled. Like my daughter well-dressed and love my home at a hotel. <laughs> Papa, Sam's a writer. They're publishing his first book. It's called Innocence Abroad, and it's all about when he was in Europe with Charles. All very well, but I still know nothing about him. And in view of this crisis, I'm going to ask both of you to suspend your romantic industries until I can find out something. Naturally, you will 
leave this house as soon as possible. Papa. Libby, I'm not being rude, just practical. I cannot honestly consider any alignment without first assuring myself that Mr. Clemens has something to offer in the way of character. And since there is no one in this part of the country who seems to know him, I suggest uh, we take other steps. Letters of reference, perhaps? Do you think that could be arranged? Well, I... I think so, Mr. Langdon. Then, fair enough. I'll leave right away, and I'll give you some names and addresses before I go. Good. And as soon as I hear any news, I'll send for you. Do we all understand each other? Yes, sir. Yes, Papa. Good. Oh, Sam. Now, now don't cry, Livy. In case I've got a character, I'll think of somebody to refer to it. <laughs> Hello, Sam. Come in, please. Libby, I... No, Sam, I... I know it's been a long time, almost six weeks, but when Papa sent for you, he made me promise to let him see you first. He's waiting for you in the library. All right, Libby. I'll go see him. Oh, Sam. Libby. Libby, hey. Clemens. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. I was just coming in. Sit down. Yes, sir. These are your letters of recommendation, Mr. Clemens. Yes, sir. They got here finally. This one from a clergyman in San Francisco. Also this one. And this one from a bank cashier in Virginia City. And uh, these others. All friends of yours, I presume? Yes, sir. I gave you their names. Well, the results are not very promising, Mr. Clemens. All of these men have been very frank about finding fault. Most of them are quite enthusiastic about your faults. And two of them predict you'll fill a drunkard's grave. Oh. What kind of people are these? Haven't you a friend in the world? Apparently not, sir. Well, then, I'll be your friend myself. Take the girl, Clemens. I know you better than any of these people do. you weren't supposed to come up here before we're married. It's bad luck. It'd be worse luck if the preacher didn't show up. Are you scared, honey? Oh, yes. Are you? I feel like I did the first time I stood in the pilot house in the river. Oh, Sam. You know, I've been thinking about that, Libby. I mean, when I was on the river. And I've been thinking about after that. In Nevada and San Francisco and all. In those days, I never knew whether I was a boy looking like a man or a man acting like a boy. Right now, I know I'm Sam Clemens and I love you. All my life, I've wondered, and Lord knows other people have wondered whatever had become of me. The day I finally saw you was the day I could answer them all. I've just been getting ready for you, Libby. And whatever I do from now on, whatever I write or think or become, I do it for you. Oh, Sam. That's the most beautiful thing you could ever say to me. You're crying, Libby. Oh, don't you know yet what you do to people, Sam? You make them so happy they have to cry. Don't ever stop, Sam. Please, don't ever stop. Clemens went on to become America's greatest humorist and writer, and the jumping frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain has become the classic in our literature. 
where Samuel Clemens didn't stop. He wrote of life as he lived it, with zest and humor and inspiration. And long after the name of Samuel Clemens was forgotten, will we remember Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, and Injun Joe, and all the others? <laughs> I should say so. Well, now here is Frank Goss. You know, this is certainly the season of sniffles and colds and flu. And remember the last time you were home with a cold? Your mail was the bright spot in the day. So why don't you stop tomorrow and pick up some Hallmark Get Well cards? You see, in the wide range of Hallmark cards, you'll find the right card for each sick friend. Comic cards for those who love a chuckle. Bright, warm cards so cheery they bring sunshine into a January room. And tender cards for your older friends or relatives. Hallmark hasn't forgotten your little friends either. There are Hallmark toy cards that are a game, a gift, and a toy all in one. Youngsters amuse themselves by assembling these punch-out paper toys. There's a gay donkey pulling a cart that can really hold things. And a cheer-up choo-choo train, complete to cowcatcher and caboose. Yet these Hallmark toy cards that bring so much fun cost just 25 cents. You'll want to be sure to include them in your selection. And remember, every Hallmark Get Well card you send carries an extra message of warmth and cheer. For the Hallmark and Crown on the back say, you cared enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Uh, thank you, thank you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, hearing you talk about making the children happy reminds me of the fellow who said, children have more need of models than of critics. <laughs> There's a lot to that, you know. And say, McDonald Carey, come back here and take a well-deserved curtain call. That was a splendid performance. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Barrymore. You know, I enjoyed playing Mark Twain. He's always been a favorite of mine. And I think I'll appreciate him even more after playing the part. Matter of fact, I'm a regular listener of the Hallmark Hall of Fame, and that's one of the things I like about your plays. Besides being entertaining, they're about real people, and they usually leave you with some food for thought. Well, well, no, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, because that's what we try to do here on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And I think you'll like next week's play. It's about Lord Robert Baden Powell. And our star will be Herbert Marshall. I'll be listening, Mr. Barrymore. And good night and thanks. Good night. Good night, McDonald Carey. Come back soon. See you all next week, ladies and gentlemen. Until then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. McDonald Carey will soon be seen in Alexander Corder's Technicolor production, Malaga. Our producer-director is William Frug. Our script tonight was written by E. Jack Newman. Featured in our cast were Barbara Eiler, Sammy Ogg, Richard Beals, Polly Bear, Roy Glenn, Jack Edwards, and Herb Butterfield. You're invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television next Sunday when Hallmark presents a special two-hour television premiere starring Maurice Evans in Shakespeare's immortal King Richard II. Consult your newspaper for time and channel. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when we'll present Mr. Herbert Marshall starring in a true story about Lord Robert baden Powell, founder of the Boy Scouts. On the following week, a true story about Madame Curie, and on February 7th, the story of Lee DeForest on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs>